Hello, this is King Unique and we're in my studio in the Welsh Hills next to a fantastic chip shop and today we're going to be looking at my remix of Javier Portela and Satella's Your Eyes. This is a remix I've done for uh, Javier Portilla and Sotella, who are two uh, Costa Rican artists. Um, this came about because I was playing over there. I had a weekend in Mexico and Costa Rica, and um, they were playing before me. And just as I was about to go on, they sort of said, oh, this is, this is a tune we're working on, and uh, pop this track on. And it's, it's like a, just a gorgeous record. So I was kind of standing there thinking, ooh, hello. You know, it's, it's that thing you do where you're DJing and you th think, shall I, you know, go and sort of try and cheekily sneak at the name? Um, and I thought, yeah, you know, they obviously want me to know what it is. So I had a quick peek and went, oh, that's good. And uh, said, yes, yeah, really, yeah, bang on. Um, so they asked, uh, you know, would you be interested in remixing it after the gig? And I, I said, yeah, yeah, I think I would. I mean, send, send it me and I'll have a listen and see what I think once I've actually heard it away from the club. So that's kind of where it started, just hearing a tune in a club and thinking that's, that's like, needs to be, needs to be something I have, I have a hand on. Um, so then it came to me, and when it arrived, uh, the, the, the bass, well, either I remembered it differently or it got a lot more interesting and funky, and when I'd heard it in the club, the first thing I'd thought was, that's kind of good, and I like all the things about it, but it, it really needs, like, some more kind of interesting stuff in the bass. And there it was. So either I'd missed it or it had been kind of finished in, well, since I'd heard it. So I was like, ah, okay. So that, that kind of side of it's now really working. So there's two things I'm mainly interested in currently, quite stylistically opposed, um, which I like kind of putting into one remix, which is that there's this, this UK bass kind of resurgence, this kind of slightly retro 90s-y thing. Um, and then there's also a parallel kind of retro movement. It's not, it's not quite so clearly signposted, but to me it, it seems very obvious, which is that the, the German sound has gone from um, the techno and then the, the deep house thing. And now they're re-examining um, that kind of, the original trance, not sort of dun 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 trance, but like 91, 92, kind of heart house and where trance started. It was generally a, quite a different feel, but it had the chordal elements and the sort of textures, but then they began becoming arpeggiated and rhythm and all that stuff. So um, people like Iron Music are, are back to my ears. I mean, maybe they're hearing something else. They're, they're mining that same area, uh, Joris Vaughan is as well. Um, and it's kind of like a sort of cross between that early trance and again, a kind of like a 1970s, German Berlin sound, what they called Kosmische music, which is like Asherah Temple and all these kind of people, well, Asherah. Um, so there's this side, which is this incredibly um, melodic, German, thoughtful, whooshy stuff. And then there's this very abrasive UK kind of speed garage noises being played at house tempo um, with quite honky clonky basses. And so I thought, yes, um, I can probably get both of those from this because it's kind of kind of beautiful song. Um, so that's where I started, was thinking that we're going to get both these into this track and that's what the remix will be. This is the original that I was uh, sent, as I say, just after the, uh, the gig. Just skip on to what's happening. Thank you. 
it's like quite a um, quite a mellow, deep sort of sound to it. I just thought it could be a little more um, a little more movement in the kind of rhythmic side of it. But I wanted to kind of keep the mellow thing going on. Um, the vocal is really kind of quite sweet. So the um, the vocal and delivery are all kind of really quite an attractive part of the song. Um, for my personal taste, and this is what remixing is all about. It's never about um, a balanced viewpoint or kind of sort of you know being the word of God. It's just endorsing your own opinions, really. For my own opinion, I kind of would like it to have a little more unusual tonality. So that's one of the things I looked at quite early on was um, just just the tone of the voice because. The delivery and everything else is, is great, um, so I just wanted to just change that. So um, I'll discuss how we got into making it it's kind of feel slightly more unusual. Um, and then really, yeah, I mean, I just started from from that. Just the MIDI parts I always request if possible. Um, as the years have gone by, I've got almost uh, allergic to actually playing black and white notes. I don't know why. Um, because I think what it is, is I've got a habit of, after all these years of doing stuff, um, of doing certain things. Everybody does. You do anything for 15 years, you get your routines. And the problem is that if you let your hands be lazy and do routines, you get the same stuff out. If you program a synth that you understand, you're going to get the same noise. So I try to baffle myself a lot by using gear oddly or um, taking away the chance to sort of just do lazy little chords. So I always ask for MIDI these days, then stick it into anything. It might come out sounding absolutely gibberish, but it means I'll probably hear something, and it's just what I hear, and not what I've thought. And if I've thought, it'll probably be something I've already done before. So if we switch across, this is the, the first um, attempt, first kind of uh, save on the session, I guess this was after a day of fiddling with it. Um, I've not heard this, so who knows what's gonna come out. I hope, fingers crossed, it sounds coherent. Okay, we've got some solo beats now. Let's get that clear. What we've got here is a mixture of some MIDI parts, some audio parts. Uh, at this stage, I've already recorded um, some pieces myself um, and laid out a, a drum pattern, which you can hear ticking away there. So if I just whiz through to the MIDI sections, we'll see what's going on there. So we have um, an array of pads. I've generally found doing um, any kind of pad stuff, if you have more than one, you just kind of get all these interesting textures. If you just kind of bring up like uh, some gorgeous Uber synth with an amazing uh, library and kind of find the fattest pad known to man, that's kind of instant gratification was actually if you pull up four or five kind of more simple ideas and then actually maneuver those around each other. You guys get this kind of richness going on. Yeah, I mean, basically what we have here is literally the same part playing through four or five different synths. I think there may actually be a piece of audio at the bottom there, which is the original audio. Yeah, that's the audio which I've sent and it's playing this same section. So we have a, a little kind of array here of, and then there's also this one, which is one of my favorite uh, plugins, which is Synplant, which is just, as I was saying before, something that is intentionally made so that you can't do your usual tricks. Well, it is, you can, you can, you can, you can cheat. Once it's inspired you, you can then kind of go in and fiddle, but I'll show you. Okay. Okay, it's adding that sort of like, a little kind of strange hiccupy sound. Again, I wouldn't sit down and think, hmm, I need a hiccupy sound. It just wouldn't occur to me. So go to something which is going to lead you. And interestingly, the guys who sent me the audio, they had also used Synplant. So I kind of thought, hang on, I recognize that tonality. And they got a kind of cello, cello, a kind of clarinet thing out of it, which is on currently. So this is a kind of quick array of some of the stuff it's playing at this point. Now, and the original track has kind of one of the strong parts of how the arrangement works is that you can see you're running through these same four chords over and over here. And then when you get to this section, um, 
it kind of switches to a new key change. Um, it's always quite a powerful thing in dance music if you set up a repetitive um, chord sequence and then you can found it after a while. I mean, the classic example is um, Stardust Music Has Better With You, where the, the bass you know, is dun 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 dun, and eventually dun dun dun, and kind of like just changes. While everything else stays the same, you get this change. And there we go, we've now gone. So by holding these kind of changes back, that really established like almost like a, kind of, uh, a monotonous mantra -y kind of thing. When you do make this change, you create a big kind of wow for, for, for a very small change, really. But it's just the, the delay and picking a moment. So one thing I had to kind of decide with this track, with my own arrangement, was how I was going to utilise these key changes, uh, which took a, a bit of fiddling around with. Now, Sinplant uh, is by a very groovy little software firm called Sonic Charge, if my mind is correct. Yeah, Sonic Charge. What you have is, um, let me just try and play some notes for you. Let's, uh, let's get the... Um, Okay, there we go. Uh, you'll notice I'm using the, the ASCII keyboard because despite owning loads of lovely synthesizers, I, um, I almost never stray from here these days. I'm afraid to say it's, it's all just places to catch dust. Now I do use them occasionally, but um, uh, just as I say, this is allergy to black and white keys. I don't, even, I don't even know where C is on here, and that again is a bonus to me. I'm not going to make sort of certain assumptions. So we play around on here. And here we go. Okay, so we've got this little kind of hiccupy synth. And on here you can see we've got um, a little tree with a seed at the centre. Okay. Now, whichever note I press gets a little marker on it. Now, if I grab that little marker, you can hear the sound changing. Now, what's happening underneath, oof, underneath the hood there is probably like about 10, 20 parameters all getting moved around at once. Um, now I've got a radically different synthesizer. Now, I don't know what's actually happened there. I couldn't tell you in like, oh yes, because it's, it's too much at once. For me, that's a huge relief. Um, if I can sort of hear stuff and work out how it's done, I'll probably then go on my usual routines. So you just listen, and once you've got a, a thing you like, so you go, okay, I kind of like this new sound, so you kind of just, um, or if you like, let's try and find that note again, he said. Okay, there we go. Now that's, each note have its own setting as well, so, so just this one note sounds like this, the guy next to it sounds like that. So you can set up really odd scales. But let's say I think, well, I found this one, that's absolutely great. I'd like that to be something I can play across the whole keyboard. So you say, plant chosen seed, and now the whole thing. If you want to again now grow it out again, you can grab it a leaf. Okay, there's a new tonality, and again you can plant that one and keep evolving and evolving and evolving. And rather handily for this session, it has an undo as well, so you can race back to where you started. So we should have. Um, now, I didn't just conjure that one up exactly like that because it's kind of curiously, beautifully in time. You'll hear when the track plays a little hiccup. You can even with this synthesizer, once you've kind of used this very broad strokes and just use your ears front end, if you absolutely have to, if you're there going, God, that's like nearly perfect, but I just need, I actually do now need to like open the filter a tiny bit or make the attack like this. <laughs> then you just um, go into the DNA. Ah. Oh. And here you have the DNA of your noise, which is great. Um, and if you want to um, look in the Oxford Dictionary, you'll find the definition of frustration is uh, everybody who uses Synplant about the fact that these can't be MIDI controlled. Um, you can't automate the, uh, the DNA. And I've, I've even tweeted Magnus about this and like sent him like a, a new GUI with just like a cut-off knob in the centre of all the beautiful plant. Just go, just please, please add that, please. So uh, again, Magnus, if, if you're watching, on behalf of your entire user base, 
please, can you please automate the DNA in this? Because it makes my life like a hundred times better. Because right now, whenever I want to do filter sweeps in here, I have to think of how I'm going to flag it another way. But anyway, it stops me doing all I want to do. That's maybe a good thing. So in here, you do have parameters of the sort that you would recognize, like, you know, um, the filter frequency, filter modulation, depth, all that sort of thing. So you're still going to kind of grab them and have a bit of a play. So um, let's see what's doing what in here. If I get to an obvious one filter frequency, you can hear that, as you'd imagine. So there we go. So you actually can then come in and like fine tune these sounds where you want them. Okay, so in here, um, up in the um, volume attack and the envelope attack and that stuff, well, I've timed in this to be just the right speed. Okay, so that's what Synplant is doing in this particular one. Um, first thing is the, the bass line is just again the MIDI that was sent. I uh, like the sound of it, it was an interesting line, I didn't see the point to change it, it's very hooky. Um, all I've done is one of those kind of classic, slightly um, electro y sounding things where you have, um, say, like a 32 oscillator, and then you switch another one up, like three or four octaves, and just layer the two together, which gives you that. And hum, 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 hum. It just makes a bass line something which is not just a, a, a low end presence, it actually has a tune. So it's a dead simple idea. Okay, so I'm using the sub boom bass um, rod paper and thing. This is pretty much, I'll be honest just a go-to synth these days. Um, when you're using actual analog stuff, uh, I've had a monopoly since God knows when. Um, um, there's, there is just a certain tonality you get used to when you actually do you know, take the time to switch your analog on and really have a proper play with it. Um, and it's the, the same boring old cliche about warmth and warm, large end and all that crap. But, um, it's often not there in a soft sense. Um, they have, you know, all kinds of wonderful qualities. Uh, when people say they're, an, they're emulating analog, sometimes they're very concerned with all the sort of the drift and the fizz and the futz and the... Um, and yeah, sometimes just what you require for bass is kind of dependability. Um, you know, what makes uh, the lovely warm sound of all is having a couple of things uh, detuned against each other. They go two oscillators slightly off. And they beat against each other wonderfully. That sounds really warm. It's not really what you need for bass. You need to have something at the very bottom of the sound, which does not have any phase problems. It's not playing against anything else. And so it's always creating a dependable pressure. Um, now, you can do that by getting any synthesizer you like in the whole world and just copying whatever part you're playing on it on a sine wave uh, and take out the bottom end of the other synth, that will give you that. Um, or you could try sub boom bass, which I don't know what the, uh, the secret is, but it does seem to have an unbelievably, dependably solid pressure in the actual lowest frequencies. Um, and well, certainly when I started making music, one of my big confusions was people go, that's a great bass sound. Um, there's two kinds of great bass sounds. There's a great bass sound that um, just literally makes subwoofers move. Like, <laughs> now, that might be the dullest sound known to man. Okay, it might literally go, mm -hmm. but it will do a fantastic job. Then there's like sort of a fantastic, amazing bass sound, like the sort of thing that, say, Tangerine Dream would use, like a kind of a, a twanging PPG yoink. You go, boing, bang, bang, bang. You go, wow, <gasps> wow, so exciting. It is very exciting, but it's not the bass part of it that's exciting. It's all the mid range and the treble and the yoink and the twang. If you want to use exciting sounding sounds for your bass line, brilliant, go ahead, do it, you know, because they're really good for the ears and they grab you, but they're not actually the bass. The bass is just that very bottom bit. And uh, if that very bottom bit has to suffer in order that you have all this yoink and twang going on, then seriously, layer a sine wave underneath it. And don't waste your time trying to EQ it, you'll spend your whole life. All you're doing with an EQ is picking one or two or three or four frequencies maybe and saying, oh, that one a bit louder. When your bass line's moving around, it's going to a different fundamental each time. Unless your EQ is tracking that fundamental, you're not going to get the result you're after. Layer a sine wave underneath it. Or use this, because it's sort of what he does. Um, so the sub boom bass is just beautifully warm. So I'll turn it up a second, I can hear what I'm talking about. Okay. And if we look here, we've simply got a square at the bottom. And then, yeah, a, um, a, saw, a saw wave. No, nope, all the way around. Ah, oh, interesting. No, aha, I tell a lie. We've got a low end saw wave and a high saw. Do that. Boom, 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 boom. 
Okay, so cool. So yeah, quite a sort of pimpy sounding electro bass. Um, electro in the original sense of electro, not electro house, which is an abomination before God. Um, <laughs> so um, where was I? Yes. So very simple the bass. Set against these uh, rather nice kicks, which we'll bring in now one at a time. Unlike uh, most people, I tend to do everything on the screen. Um, although I've recently been tempted by that um, uh, Arteria, Arteria Spark. That kind of that looks interesting um, because I'm sort of enjoying more and more this kind of bassy, drummy thing. So maybe I might go there. But um, uh, I was making uh, remixes back in the nineties when it wasn't audio. Everything was still. Um, sequences and Akai is full of samples and all that stuff. So this was just like a revelation uh, when it first happened. Um, around about 99, 2000, I think I began using uh, audio as a main thing. And the ability to just put the sounds on a screen and every single waveform to be that one, not like sort of this kick repeated 77,000 times and if it changes, they all change. I didn't want that, I wanted to actually have every single drum beat there. So I wanted to just turn one round, or make that one filtered, or just drag it, or stretch it, or do something to it. That's the one I'm working with. So, um, so that habit became established at that point. It seemed to me like an incredible opportunity. You know, just couldn't do it before. So, um, the uh, the drums are pretty much, I think, all on the screen. Let me have a quick look. Yeah, we have a. Very simple little garagey loop there. Now we'll see some quite sort of, I think quite sparse elements as well. We'll take the main loop out, you'll hear those I guess. That, that, um, this is quite a, quite a, a a key sort of garagey sound that you don't tend to find as much in, say, techno. It's um, because the beats are very strongly swung. You have this kind of like uh, you, you, know, you, you get quite a strong swing in the 16s. Um, everything is kind of rolling into the beat after it. That um, and because it's this kind of like sort of dragging you into the next beat, rolling sound. Quite a nice sound is to just kind of like blunt off the front of a sound. You can um, either use something like the Enveloper in Logic or um, I think Flux Bittersweet, all these things that, you know, the transient designers, you can use one of those to take the front off a sound. Or just simply, you know, come in here, um, cut it and stick a fade on it. Just like, you know, literally, if, if, we were, if I wanted to soften this sound, you can just stick the edit there and fade through into it, you know. So these things um, just create little kind of anticipations and make the sort of swings roll nicely. Something as simple as that. Um, so. Let's keep seeing what else is in here in case there's any other exciting illustrative points. Again, there's a little, that little sw swung snare again. Kind of a little texture just come in. That's one of the original parts I was sent. Um, I've really not kept much of the original drum beat, but that's just got tons of character, so it's gone. Um, what we're looking at here is the end of where I reached on day one. I, mean, I don't know how fast everybody else works. I know some people are like going to studio six hours later, they leave. Um, I wish. Uh, it's happened once or twice in 20 years. Um, but no, I find that uh, I kind of do a day, wrap it, come back. And so there's like about, I think this was like a seven or eight day session, not like a whole, you know, kill yourself day, but I sat down to it seven or eight times. Um, so what we're looking at here is literally where I reached the end of day one. The drums are in, there's some ideas down for the pads. Um, I haven't yet looked at the vocal, I don't think, oh, well, let's see if I have, because that's, as I said earlier, there's some interesting work there. And then the whole thing that really, um, I tend to get, luckily, my ideas in quite fast, but um, my arrangements, I do like to slave over. So the arrangements are quite a, a, a slow building process. 
So um, we're looking at the um, the final uh, stage, sort of stage of the process here. And what we've got down the bottom is the vocal channel. I'll try and uh, give you just a quick blast of her. Um, Girl, I say come here. Let go, release your fear. I, th I think even in this take, I had done nothing um, particularly dramatic to her, but I just used a formant shifter to make her a touch deeper. So she's still singing exactly the same pitch, but I'm just slightly dropped the formants and so that her voice kind of warms and mellows. Um, that was kind of what I was hoping would give me the result I was after. It didn't really quite do it, to be honest. She still felt a little kind of like sort of bright for the mood I was after. So, um, I copied the voice across and just sometimes if you um, if you think about how sound works it's it's um, like any sound has its fundamental pitch okay which is what we say when we're talking about you know, the melody you're playing or whatever it might be and then there's the harmonics and the harmonics are there's this related structure of frequencies above right um, if you pitch shift something all these f structures are, in, are kind of retained intact if you keep them about the same volume, you can hear it's a pitch shift. You can hear there's two things tracking side by side. Uh, if you pitch shift something, then drop it down quite a lot, like really, really quite a lot, you can start to feel a bit like a harmonic uh, of the original. So you can just use it to add like an unusual tone in there. So I think this, from memory, I ended up finding that the sound I liked best was copying a whole vocal, dropping it down five semitones. So essentially it was a musical, a musical fifth, but played an octave below. Um, and then making the, the formant shift even more aggressive on the vocal copy. So you end up essentially with her sort of slightly butch, strangled sounding sister kind of singing just quietly behind her. Um, and when the two are layered together, I'll play the, the shifted version on its own, which sounds like this. It's got a slightly kind of glottal sound that you often get with pitch shifting. And sometimes that's a problem. I wasn't bothered because it's not going to be the lead voice. So the two together create this then slightly kind of interesting, almost kind of oriental uh, thing. I say come here, let go, release your fear. I just don't know if this is all right. In addition to that, there's so the vocal itself, this is generally a sign you're onto a good thing as if you can mute sections and they sound interesting on their own. So yeah, the, the vocals now are quite a strong element. They've got this chopped up section which again came from uh, Javier and Satella. Uh, I've done this pitch shifting thing for a kind of harmonic effect. No, in, in solo isolation like this, you can hear very clearly it's two voices. With everything playing together, it's it's less obviously, you know, a duet with, with uh, Kermit the Monster Frog. It just sounds like um, she's just got like a, a, a kind of just slightly more engagingly odd sound. <laughs> So the deeper harmony also kind of, as, as it turns out, you can sort of, you, these lucky things occur. The deeper harmony kind of like has a certain shared tonality with this, this droning bass. And so the slightly hides behind it. So it just creates this nice deeper mood to the track. The whole, the whole process of sort of arranging and mixing and writing and editing and all this is, uh, for me personally, completely uh, simultaneous. I don't sort of think, throw up some ideas and it'll sound great in the mix later because um, I'm, I'm sort of really busily trying to create something um, 
very sort of specific, and I never know what it is as I'm going along. Um, some people think in far more broad strokes, they're like, you know, we just need a bass, we need some good beats, we need, you know, a nice catchy bit, we need a... And then when they get to the finish, they're like, okay, now let's really sculpt. And uh, I'm sort of sitting around fiddling over details you never hear. And, you know, fussing, of, oh, who's the tail end of that bass? Is it eating the start of the kick? Um, now these things, they do all add up, um, you know, making sure that the bass end, that kicks and bass lines, you know, kind of just uh, watch your note lengths and all this kind of stuff. Um, but I'm, a, I'm absorbed by it from the start, so um, I, I'm sort of playing you stuff here which has kind of already been mixed, say what would have been two or three days earlier. Um, I mean I guess an interesting illustration would be that we were looking at the initial idea I had on the pads, the other three or four layers. Um, I think probably one or two of those ended up being kind of replaced with something a bit more exciting. Um, as I was saying before, this kind of feeling that you should be able to mute um, stuff and end up with a track that's still coherent. Um, this is a reasonably good example. It kind of sounds like a, a very nice ambient record on its own. Really. Mm -hmm. This stuff's opening up and expanding and growing and there's kind of chords climbing and climbing. Um, again, you know, I've made very careful, I haven't played anything, but I have um, unfortunately rendered into audio now, I can't show you the MIDI, but uh, that initial, you know, da, 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 four chords is now kind of da, 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 and, you know, kind of echoing and repeating the chords up. I quite like sitting here pushing things around. I'll sort of, you know, pull open MIDI and grab a note and pull around and listen. Again, listening. I'm not suggesting anybody else do this, by the way. It's the same way of working. Use a keyboard for a really good reason. But this is how it happens, is just I like to push things and listen and go, oh, yes. So having started with the shape of their tune, I wanted to kind of have large, surging kind of sections. And then one thing that's quite lovely about their track is it is quite intimate, it is quite deep. So we kind of push to these big sections and then bring it right back down. So um, I'll just play you the, um, the kind of, I guess, the, the, the breakdown at this point. Now, as I said before, I wanted to make sure it had Cosmetia, trancey, early trance, not current trance, early trance vibes, uh, and this garagey bass stuff. And then, because I do like making my life hard, I thought, and what it should do is at the end, it should go a bit sort of like, it have like a slightly techno flavor in some respect before it finishes. So, because um, uh, then if you just make a like, lovely blissy record, everybody goes, oh, it's a blissy, lovely record. If it kind of then just kind of surprises you uh, a bit like, I don't know, like sort of being punched by your grandma or something, and it appeals to loads more people. You kind of sort of go, whoa, hang on, I thought, oh, I thought it was all going to be blissful and lovely. And then I got, got grand punched. So this track has a bit of a grand punch in it. Uh, fingers crossed it'll just play for us all now. Um, so I'll play like the last kind of few bars of the rah kind of bit, and then it comes right down, gets really peaceful, and then it has a bit of a, a, bit of a growl out at the end, which I'll explain after. <laughs> 